Hey everybody, I have a video here for you tonight. Now this is pretty much a culmination of over a year's worth of research that I've done on the Shroud of Turin. And it's by far the most strangest, weirdest, most fascinating thing that I have ever researched. And I'm sure all research in the future will pale in comparison. And originally when I started researching the Shroud, I made my first video in January 2015, and I will leave all the links for my previous Shroud videos in the description. But when I fir first started looking into it, I thought that I would find it to be a medieval forgery that the church was trying to attach its resurrection story to. And to my amazement, I found it to be just the opposite. I found it to be an actual 2,000-year-old artifact that the church was trying to discredit for some reason and that just left me baffled ever since my first upload on this i have felt empty and kind of lost that i have been missing something in these uploads and uh, the shroud i thought i would look into right away but everything that i have researched on its authenticity is it comes from 2000 years ago and it was in jerusalem and it was in turkey and there are things that would stand up in a court of law that will prove that today and this was not a medieval forgery. There's no way a medieval forger would uh, foresee the invention of high-tech forensic cameras, you know, 600 years down the line that would show things that were never seen before in the shroud. So to say it's a medieval forgery is absolutely ridiculous. Now, I really had no idea how to present this information. In fact, I was telling somebody yesterday on Skype that even though I know the story backward and forward and I know it by heart, I have no idea how to present this. So, you know, I just thought I would go over some of the basic points and try to get to the conclusion as soon as possible instead of losing you in a sea of facts and quotes and texts and websites. But I am going to go defer to a couple different websites during this video and play one brief clip. But when researching this, I realized the history of the Shroud of Turin was just kind of lost for one fact that it was never called the Shroud of Turin until it was already about 1500 years old or so. And it originally was called the Image of Edessa. And it's so clear to me that what was known as the Image of Edessa, which was just the face of Christ in the middle of a cloth, was, you can see here, this is the original shroud. This is the negative over here, the, this picture. This is the negative that was taken in uh, 1880, I believe. But the original image of Edessa was just the face of Christ. And it's so obvious by the fold marks here that it was just the shroud folded up. There's a whole bunch of evidence that says that. And it's clear that the very earliest mention of what we know today is the Shroud of Turin comes from what I talked about the other day. Uh, the Hymn of the Robe of Glory is the title of that paper. And the song they talk about was originally called, or is called, the Hymn of the Pearl. And Pearl was a code word that church historians, and they all knew about the Shroud, or what we know today as the Shroud, but they all knew about this image. And Pearl was a code word for image and clement of alexandria who was really egypt's christian historian in the second and third century he wrote this about matthew 13 and this is just his commentary on the bible in matthew 13 and mentions a pearl of great price and what does the clement of alexandria say that pearl was a pearl and that pellucid of purest ray is jesus whom of the lightning flash of divinity the virgin bore for as the pearl produced in flesh and the oyster shell and moisture appears to be a body moist and transparent, full of light and spirit, so also God the Word incarnate is intellectual light sending his rays through a body luminous and moist. And if that doesn't talk of the Shroud of Turin, nothing does. That's clear and that's obvious. And that hymn I believe is the first mention of what we know today as the Shroud of Turin. And that comes from just maybe a few decades after the temple in Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD. And I believe that is where the true history comes from that's written in the Bible and where the Shroud comes from. And in that writing, it is referred to as the image of the King of Kings. 
and I believe the Jesus character really wasn't invented at this time, so that is the first really uh, defining term of the Shroud of Turin. It is the image of the King of Kings, and that hymn was written by somebody who was raised in the court of royalty at Edessa. So I think that really speaks of who is represented on the Shroud and who it is exactly. I don't think that is important. I think it is important just to look at what the Shroud represented. Everybody has been concentrating on how the Shroud was made or is this Jesus or not? And they really haven't concentrated just on what the Shroud represented. And I wanted to look into everything about this time period. The Bible, the Antiquities by Josephus or Josephus. I wanted to look into the history of Edessa. I wanted to look into the history of the Shroud. And I wanted to look into the history of the Dead Sea Scrolls just because they were an unfiltered version of what was actually going on 2000 years ago. And one of the links I'm gonna leave below is for Robert Eisenman. And he was kind of the last thing that I really looked into deeply and that was the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's clear that the history of this time period around 2000 years ago around the Jerusalem area was one of revolt and warfare and this messianic movement that was coming up around the Dead Sea Scrolls area and the Qumran area was one of revolt against Rome. They were the evil empire and these people had to look somewhere for some help and it was this was such a time where spirituality ruled in these people's lives and this new messianic movement was really catching wildfire and there was a specific reason for it and there was an original version i always wondered why the bible was done in aramaic and it's just one of the things about this time period i've always wondered about but the original books were written in aramaic and it's so obvious to me now that the Romans did a rewrite of an earlier spiritual tale, and that came from Edessa, Turkey, and the Shroud was a main player in it. And I needed to look into all these different avenues to maybe find that one clue that would make everything clear. And I think I found it, and I think it's obvious why the Romans did a rewrite of an earlier spiritual tale. And when I say the Bible is a, you know, a rewrite, a Hollywood version, you know, I don't mean to impugn anybody's religious beliefs. Um, I don't think it is required that you believe a spiritual tale to be actual historical fact in order to get benefit from it. So uh, if you already have faith in the Bible, it doesn't matter what a dude sitting on his couch in Las Vegas says, but I want to find some true history, what we can actually prove based on what we know from all these sources. Now, one of the greatest uh, pieces of evidence that the church did a rewrite of some earlier history coming out of Edessa, Turkey, is that uh, the church historians tried to discredit the image of Edessa and Edessa in general in their writings. And they knew they had a problem in Edessa, this growing messianic revolutionary movement against Rome needed to be stopped. And the image was a main source of the pilgrimage and the growth of this religion. And the church knew they had a problem and they needed to put something in writing to discredit the shroud. So really the first church mention of the shroud comes from Eusebius in 325. And he says basically this, that Jesus wiped his face with a cloth and an image became imprinted on the cloth. And that was delivered to King Agbar, who was sick, suffering from leprosy and the king by just merely receiving the image of Jesus was cured of his leprosy. So the Romans, <laughs> it's so obvious, they had to put their own story on this image of Edessa, and they said, it's their Jesus, wiping his face on this towel, and that's just a, such a ridiculous story on how this revered image came to being. And they also say about the king of Edessa that he has leprosy. And there's nothing lower you could say about a person at this time 
If you have leprosy, you're really not even allowed in town, I think, back in this time, so there's nothing lower to be said about somebody. And they say this about the King of Edessa. The church's disinformation campaign is so obvious, and it's part of the whole story. And I just wanted to point that out. So I had all this, all these stories piling up, and it was clear that the Church of Rome had a problem with Edessa. They knew where the original story came from. They were trying to discredit the image that they knew existed. And if they knew it existed, why didn't they put it on the cover of the Bible? And why isn't it hung in every church? It would be the greatest verification of the Bible story. But no, the church is trying to discredit it, so there is a story. We have the shroud. It's a real artifact. We have the church pushing against it. So I was hoping this story would all become clear to me. And uh, this picture, this is the passion. This was painted, I believe, four or 500 years ago. I'll leave a link to that. And in case you hear some strange noises, we are having a terrible windstorm in Las Vegas here today. So at times it feels like, sounds like my roof is coming off. So th those are the noises you might hear in the background. But what I wanted to do as the final thing I investigated, I wanted to look at the history of the apocryphal texts, the books that the church does not want allowed in the Bible for some reason. And that's where I found it. Church historians writing on about these texts, these original texts, the original versions of the texts, they say in the version of, I believe, the Monday after the crucifixion, they go to the tomb, and in those original versions, it says all they find is the image of the Lord on the burial shroud. That's all they say. And when I read that, it was like a light bulb going off in my head. That was the answer I was looking for. Everything started making sense. Uh, things just started rushing to my head. And more importantly, my intuition knew I had it. That was the story. And uh, I am going to play just a little clip from a radio interview I just happened to find a couple days later. And uh, the background on this video is a little strange, but it's a Creative Commons video. It's resharable, and I'm going to share it right now. Clothes? From the standpoint of Jewish burial practices, there's nothing that would suggest that the shroud could not be an authentic burial shroud. One legitimate objection, if you would, if, if you would is that certainly the scripture mentions a burial shroud, mentions that Joseph of Arimathea is the man who purchased the linen shroud, which Jesus would be wrapped. There is kind of a glaring omission in scriptures, which is the scripture doesn't mention images on a linen shroud. Kind of a point for the opposition, if you would. But I think it would be instructive to ask this question then, because, because not everything is recorded in scripture. How far back in time does the idea or the concept of Jesus's image on his linen shroud, how far back in time does that go? There's something called the Mozarabic Rite of Holy Week. This is a group of Arab Catholics that emigrated to Spain in the sixth century. And they translate John 1940 this way. So, you know, normally you'd read, say, Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there. That's how we'd normally read that translation. They translate it this way. Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the recent imprints of the dead and risen man on the linens. That's phenomenal. That's 1,500 years old. Now, the question is, does it go all the way back to the first century? And I don't know. But I do know this, that the very first piece of evidence to Peter and John that, gee, that, that something extraordinary had happened in that tomb is specifically related to the burial shroud. Now, I found that clip maybe three or four days after I did the study on the apocryphal text, and that was just confirmation of what I figured was now to be the story, the true story, where we can separate uh, what can be provable and what can be just based on faith. So I thought that was really interesting, and all they found, all they found in the tomb, according to the most original versions of the books that the church doesn't want you to read, is that all they found in the tomb 
was the image of the Lord on the burial shroud. And this is on the left here. This is all they found. This explains the biblical appearances of Jesus after he was uh, crucified and the confusion of the people who, who thought they saw Christ but were not sure if it was him. This explains it. This explains it perfectly. And how the shroud was made, there are a lot of theories out there, and the truth is, even today, people cannot explain for sure with any degree of certainty how the shroud was made. And there are a lot of theories, and some of them are kind of, you know, kind of decent. I don't know. I don't even know how to say it, but uh, there is still no variable fact on how the shroud was made. Uh, you know, they say that the shroud, this herringbone weave linen, after it was made, it was treated in a solution of some sort, and that the reaction of the dead body with ever it had on it or coming out of it at the time of death and at the beginning stages of decomposition reacted with a protein that was left from the solution that the shroud was soaked in after it was made, and this somehow made this image. Um, that is decent. That is a decent explanation for me, but it's nothing of certainty. But the fact is, I think uh, that one day we might figure out how it was made, and there might be a solution, and it can be based on what we can prove. And I think the reason why we don't have an answer now is because the research on the shroud can be measured in hours and days instead of decades and centuries. So maybe with further tests, but the New Testament was just pouring back into my mind. And if this was indeed the original version that all they found was the shroud with the image of the Lord on it, that explains so many things. Let me read you the beginning of the book of Peter. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom thou ye see him, not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And what that verse says is this. It says there is an appearance of Jesus Christ that hasn't quite faded away, and though you recognize it as Jesus, your belief or faith that it is him is a glorious testament to the salvation of your soul. And that is exactly what that verse says, and that just speaks of the Shroud of Turin. That's what the whole original story was based on. Now, after making this realization, I knew I had to do one thing. I had to read the New Testament again, and as much as I didn't want to do that, because it is really hard to do, and anybody who has tried to read the Bible can verify that, but I wanted to read it kind of with these new, this new vision of mine, how to look at the New Testament, and when I did read it, let me tell you, it blew me away. I knew this was the story. And I kind of understood for the first times how the Romans did their rewrite of the New Testament. And uh, even the, uh, the gardener story, Mary thinks she's, she sees somebody and she says it's a gardener and then realizes it was Jesus. I think this is explained with the fact that there was a lot of flowers, I guess, originally wrapped in the burial shroud with the body. And I think that just explains that perfectly. But this is just one of countless things I found in the New Testament that explains the appearances and people being confused. Is, is this really Jesus or not? And uh, I think that that was the foundation of the original story. All they found was a shroud. And that is where you can separate the whole unbelievable 
divine stuff from the possible. And this was the miracle that spawned the intense faith that was spreading that threatened Rome so much that they had to do an overwrite of this religion and start their own religion based on these original books. But they had to make it a little more glorious and they had to have Jesus walking around after he had died. The original story, it was just the shroud they found. And now, 2,000 years later, the shroud is scoffed at and dismissed for so many reasons. And that is the irony of all holy ironies is that so many believe the shroud is some sort of fake Jesus relic. But if it wasn't for the shroud, the Bible never would have been written because it was the appearance, it was the miracle, it was the New Testament of the glory of God. And that is what makes the shroud the perfect ancient artifact. If you want to believe this was made in some divine, miraculous way, the faith in that is understood. People have been believing that way for about 2,000 years. And if you want to pull a true original story out of the Bible, the shroud is definitely the key because this was a real man and he was from the kingdom of Edessa, Turkey. And identifying this man is not so important but just knowing where he came from, because then everything else makes sense, and you can attach true history to the most sacred relic of all time, and it is the most fascinating thing I have ever researched. And though I believe this story makes the most sense and is the most likely to be true, I myself have having um, a difficult time believing this, and I don't ask you to believe this story that I told you 100%, even though I do, and it's based on countless hours of tireless research. <laughs> but I just ask you to take into consideration what you heard today. Now, I know you thought this was interesting. You have a nice day.